hello everyone. Yes, it works. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, thank you for inviting me, HKW. And uh, special thanks to Katrin and uh, Ashkan uh, for having me here in this very special program. Today, I want to talk to you about visualizing the invisible, about making something visible, about showing something alive. I want to talk to you about imagining something hidden, something perhaps inside your head. Um, and in this brief talk, I will speak about a few things that are here uh, projected on screens and a few things that are not here, but that, that we'll have to imagine. Let me begin this um, by thinking a little bit about the space in which we find ourselves today. So we are enclosed by the oval shape of the roof that sort of touches the floor that we are on, on, on both sides. And on your right here, there's the uh, pond and the, the chunky golden sculpture. And on your left, there's the, the river that's bending away, bordering the park. And, and on your, in your front of you and behind you, there's uh, trees and grass and, and, and roads in the park. And between your head and the ceiling, there's a lot of space. And below your feet, below the floor, there's more space, then another floor, more space, until we reach the, the soil of the park. We are enclosed by the, by the oval shape of the roof. Today, I want to turn to a micro history of visualizing, of making visible that which was otherwise invisible of rendering the world anew. I want to talk to you about animation machines, machines that animate matter, machines that make things look alive, uh, machines that show an interior world that is otherwise hidden. And in particular, I want to talk about uh, two animation machines that, that tried in different ways to make visible the invisible world inside our head sort of the mindscape or the brain space where imagination takes place. And the first animation machine that I talk about today was developed by a Berlin doctor, Dr. Karl Reicher, in 1907. And the second machine, the second animation machine I talk about resulted in the film you see projected here uh, on the big screen, a film by the artist Oscar Fischinger. So two films, one by Carl that remains invisible, and one by Oscar right here. The first film by, by Carl it remains invisible today because it hasn't been saved in, in any archive or library. It is a film we can only imagine. In 1907, Carl aimed to reveal the complex anatomy of the human brain that he had been studying for so many years. And he therefore invented a procedure that he called a cinematographic demonstration of the inside of the brain. A kinematographie de neurologie. Uh, around the turn of the century, new visual technologies such as X-rays had turned the interior body into a space that could possibly become visible. The inside of the head was one of those special spaces that aroused a particular and peculiar desire to move inside. Around this time, one might say that the invisibility of the brain became more visible, that the inside of the head was now a visible invisible, 
waiting to be revealed. Immediately, yeah. Immediately, the famous Thomas Edison promised he would be the first to produce an X-ray of the brain, even though the skull surely obscured his goal. I mean, it's hard to, to project through this. In various journals, a number of scientists produced dubious illuminations of the inside of the head. At least one of these attempts was exposed as a fraud, the image identified as a photograph of the bowels of a cat. The possibility of visually recording the brain of a living human was so alluring because it tapped into a desire to look beyond the anatomy of the brain into the realm of mind reading or of thought photography and visualizing mental activity. The machine of Carl's Kinematographie de Neurologie similarly tried to bring brain space alive. The first step in the process was to create dead images of the brain by choosing a very small part of the cerebral object, so the brain as an object, you would uh, choose a very small part of it and then cut this very small part into a thousand extremely thin sections. Carl would then use a microscopic camera to photograph those tiny sections, a thousand dead images, one after the other. And when these photographs were projected in sequence rapidly, there would arise what Carl called a living image of the brain. It would unfold before our eyes with the unfurling of the film strip. Several viewers of the film uh, reported a feeling of movement when they were looking at it. Um, they saw um, nerve bundles cross in the space and they saw sort of white pathways moving in this space. Um, and even though spectators were effectively looking at st a still dead object, they observed a brain space full of activity, of matter in motion. The animation machine that finally resulted from Carl's experiments wasn't very successful. To produce about one minute of brain cinematography was an expensive and, and difficult process. It required extensive editing and centering of the images, and um, one also needed to remove uh, flickering and flex. Um, and these films probably also didn't add much to anatomical knowledge. They, they didn't clearly show how things were connected. They were more like misty journeys uh, that showed the brain as a space that was somehow alive. For science, this machine was not of much significance. I did not find a reference of, of, of anybody using, actually using this machine. But 30 years later, 30 years later, one artist listed the machine as a predecessor of a new animation technique. And here I turn to Oscar's film. Um, at his home in Munich, a young Oscar used the bathtub to experiment with the effects of flowing water, of uh, fluid inked, uh, ink and, and melted wax. And um, in the bathtub, what fascinated him was that dead things, so mere materials, could look strangely alive. His wish was to create a cinematography of fluid substances and imagined life, a cinema that would arise that would arise from and transcend the lines and volumes of the natural world. Those were his words. From, from, this, from this evolved the Wachsmaschine, the wax slicing machine, a device that worked kind of as a meat cutter, pushing a block of colored wax towards a knife blade with each consecutive slicing of a piece of wax, a camera would photograph the remaining block. Um, for example, um, 
cutting a, a cone-shaped form from top to bottom meant that you would see a small circle and that would rapidly appear bigger. So you're sort of traveling through that cone. And, and I'm showing you here some images of the patent that was made for a wax machine that was created a little later. Um, the images show how the shapes would behave within the block of wax. Um, to create a wax film, uh, different pieces of porcelain, clay, and colored wax, they were, they were molded and, and dripped and, and pushed together in a rectangular mold. So wax films required Oscar to choreograph his animation within the three-dimensional space of the block. So he had to sort of mentally map the behavior of the shapes before, um, so constructing an, an imagined internal world, you could say, before it would be fragmented again. Putting these dead images together resulted in a kind of stop-motion recording of the changing cross-sections of the wax. This is what you see here. Um, and again, it was as if we were traveling through space. Yet the morphing entities on the screen were not figures sketched by an artist. Instead, they, they possessed this sort of strange, otherworldly quality. In some of the surviving sequences of Oscar's wax experiments, we see the wax sort of ooze slowly out of the center of the screen in concentric circles, giving us a feeling of sort of moving inside the material. From Carl to Oscar, these animation machines had moved from brain space to mental space, from gray matter to colored clay. Just like section brains, however, sliced blocks of wax were not easy to handle. You needed thousands of cuts for just a few minutes uh, of film. The material was uh, difficult to work with, and, and it resisted easy processing. Uh, the lights in the animation studio would, would cause the wax to melt, so the blocks needed to be frozen in order to be used. And even then, uh, they would, would quickly begin to sweat, so you would have to wipe them all the time. The smooth, magical appearance of the wax was in fact the result of a tiresome procedure, just like Carl's brains had resisted simple cinematography. One animation artist called this process free animation, because one never really knew what the end result would be. The material really had a, had a life of its own. Um, and and I, want to end, I want to end my talk with a turn to visualizing in relation to the Anthropocene, the, the subject of the, the, the program uh, of which these demonstrations are part. And I turn here. Some of you might be familiar with one of last year's uh, YouTube hits. It's a video entitled Babies at First Car Wash, a video compilation of about a dozen babies experiencing a car wash for the very first time. I don't know, maybe some of you have also had this experience. Um, so each scene in this YouTube film shows a baby filmed up close, strapped to the back seat of a car. Um, parents zoom in on the baby's face as their child is about to undergo a, a life-changing experience. Um, suddenly, uh, you, see, you hear these humming sounds grow louder and louder, and water and soap starts to begin to, to pour over the car, and the, the pupils of the baby enlarge. <laughs> Strange alien-looking forms ap appear on the surface, and, 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 and they are featured on the, on the screens all around the child. Colorful, artificial things that change shape, twirl and rage over the front and the, the back and the side windows of the car. The pupils of the baby grow even bigger. <laughs> Hypnotized, it holds its breath. A new unknown world is pressing against the screen. Something really weird is going on here. To think about the idea of the Anthropocene in relation to the films of Carl and Oscar is to think about a baby in a car wash. 
The word Anthropocene just as Holocene or Pleistocene guides us to think of the world in a geological way, in the sense of stratigraphy, as slices, sequences, cuts. Yet at the same time, the films of Carl and Oscar show how much the projections depend uh, on a molding together of the desires of the animator, the machine, and the material. It can thus be difficult to make sense of the shapes squashed against the windshield of the car. If the Anthropocene is a matter of stratigraphy, of a cutting practice that shows the visible and invisible ways in which humans have suffused with things, then the films of Oscar and Carl show us that to imagine the Anthropocene would be much like being a baby in a car wash. Just like Carl's animation machine put dead cerebral matter into movement, made visible and alive the space inside our head, Oscar's wax machine pushed imagined worlds into blocks of unpredictable matter. Layer by layer, a new interiority was revealed, a world of things that unfurled beyond the mind of the animator. Thank you.